there and welcome to WADR's gender program 5050 on West Africa Democracy Radio 94.9 FM in Dakar, Senegal. We're also live on Alternative Youth Radio in Lofa County, Liberia and around the world on WADR.org. My name is Atiye Win in Bila Lawson and I am the host of the program. Here on 5050, we discuss all things gender equality, equity and equal opportunities for men and women and how to promote a more women-friendly environment. We also discuss social issues and how men and women react and are affected by these. This month on 5050, we are discussing evolving beauty trends and standards. We started our conversation by exploring makeup and hair trends. Then we looked at bodies, specifically cosmetic surgery and the global craze for perfection. Today, we discuss two topics, body dysmorphic disorder, which in layman's terms is a mental health condition where one is fixated on their perceived flaws in their appearance. And we also discuss ageism, which is defined as the discrimination against older people because of negative and inaccurate stereotypes as explained by Nigerian show host, Comfort Booth. Ageism is not only seen in the most obvious place, which is the workplace, but even in speech, telling a woman she's too old to wear certain styles of outfits, particularly ones that are considered sexy, praising older people by comparing them to younger ones. You look young for your age. Ah, you're young at heart. Are you really that old? Or labeling products, anti-aging products, services, wonder treatment, surgery. In recent years, phrases like, oh my, you look older than your age. The wrinkles are coming all. You're starting to look like your mother. Often makes recipients feel self-conscious, especially when on the media, traditional and social media, all you see are ads and products explaining why youth is in and elderliness is not. For women, the situation seems worse. Elijah Felix, a member of Nigeria's Toastmasters, explains. In this part of the world, we have a mindset problem, individual, and also we have a societal orientation. You know, it's always hard on the women. Yeah, old women like you, see what they do. I'm using local parlance. But if it is the men, they don't really even talk about it, especially when the men are wealthy. They don't care. Also, have you ever heard the phrase, men age like wine and women like cheese? These inaccurate, discriminatory, and distasteful phrases push some to undergo procedures and processes sometimes dangerous and life-threatening, all in search of youth. Remember to follow our discussion on Twitter and Instagram at WADR News, on Facebook at West Africa Democracy Radio English Service, and online at WADR.org. Also, you can leave me a message via WhatsApp at plus two two one seven eight one eight four five four two one again plus two two one seven eight one eight four five four two one and please begin your message with hashtag fifty fifty now let's start our conversation with a report on the processes procedures and the lengths that men and women engage in to achieve or maintain their youth Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the freshest of them all? The hunger for youth has become almost an obsession, insatiable at all costs and by all means. Wrinkles are frowned upon and women and men are facing increasing pressure to look 20, even though they are 40. Yvonne Mills, CEO of JNEC Skin Repair and Laser Center based in Ghana, says focusing on your face for men and women 
is the first step to maintaining your youth. Sun damage, so they've got pigmentation, dark patches. Even men mm. can get dark patches on their cheeks. Skin care is, is very, very important because you, you, you cover everywhere on your body. Mm. And the, the bit that you, lo you, you don't cover is your face, mm. which is the one that deals with all the pollution and the sun exposure and the dust and environmental stress. Mm. So you need to give it extra care. Mm. That is why there's so many products just for the face. While this may be the case, the Harvard Business School Review indicates that much of gendered ageism is hinged on looks or appearance as a function of societal value something also described as lookism. The incessant pressure to look young and attractive is something that typically impacts women more than men. Social media content creator Akai Kote lists some procedures many women are engaging in to achieve youth. If you are aging on your skin and you want to like look for all these treatments, so sunscreen, there's also um, microneedling. So microneedling, like when you do those kind of treatments, they make your skin look more youthful because it's like it's piercing your skin to damage, damage the skin so that it produces like um, newer cells. Mm -hmm. So that it makes your skin look a bit fuller. Mm -hmm. But obviously people want the faster way. As someone who has undergone some of these procedures, Akai admits that these can become addictive as society's expectations and beauty standards also change. I guess like even with Africans, like we have full lips. So I don't know if I would do like get fuller lips, but that's just me right now. I don't know what it will be like in the next two or three or five years. Mm -hmm. But there's this thing where your lips can get wrinkled, where you want it to be stretched out a little bit. The thing about all these procedures is when you do it once, you start seeing different things and you want to keep going. Because mind you, when you do your lips, your nose starts looking different because it doesn't match your lips. They do your nose, it doesn't match. They do your, your cheeks. And that's when it gets dangerous. And for me, for anything that seems addictive, like I really take my time to understand it first before I even start. Because I know that once I start, I'll keep seeing things that I can fix. And obviously we are growing and you see little lines and you're like, can I fill this? The other day, the other day I was speaking to my, uh, my statistician I'm like, can I get like um, fillers? An article on the Seneca Falls Dialogues Journal states that lookism or ranking an individual based on attractiveness informs employment and societal prejudice. Research further shows that looks influence salaries, careers, growth, and even hiring. And because it is difficult to prove, there is no legislation that specifically addresses lookism. Maintaining a prescribed appearance is necessary in an appearance-focused society like ours, and staying young is a central part of it, as explained by Studio 7 Beauty Lounge owner Trudy Arnold Boating. It stimulates cellular repair and restores collagen and elastin production in the body. Collagen and elastin, these are the factors in the skin that um, keep the skin really tight and youthful. As we age, as we grow, these factors break down and that's when we start to, you know, look some way and start sagging and mm -hmm. we're just not as, you know, as we look in our teens. In sure. Teens, that's when they're ripe, yes. Mm -hmm. Majority of Trudy's clientele is female but some do come with their spouses. I mean, I, have pe I, I love when, you know, women come with their husbands. A lot of men don't understand these treatments. So for a man to actually drag her, his wife to the studio and, you know, make these inquiries, and a lot of them actually get treatment, uh, treatments together as well. Fillers, Botox, infusions, yeah, and they don't play with it. So how far would you go to keep up with the trends? You are listening to WADR's gender program 5050 with Atewin Ibila Lawson. The program is live on 94.9 FM in Dakar, Senegal, Alternative Youth Radio in Lofa County, Liberia, and around the world on WADR.org. 
Thank you for staying with us. Today on 5050, we are continuing our conversation about evolving beauty trends and standards and how these affect men and women. Just gone by was a report about ageism and lookism and how they affect especially women. In this part of our program, we talk about body dysmorphic disorder. When I was researching on this month's conversation about beauty, body, and the changing trends, something kept popping up, body dysmorphic disorder. To explore this further and to look at whether, as it has been confirmed this month, women are most affected, I have been speaking to Dr. Daniel Forger, a clinical psychologist with the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital in the Ashanti region of Ghana, and a lecturer with the Garden City University College, also in Kumasi, in Ghana's Ashanti region. I started the interview by asking him what body dysmorphic disorder is. Body dysmorphic disorder uh, can also be referred to in, in the simple term or the simple layman term as a body image disorder. Now, it is basically a mental illness involving obsession or an obsessive focus on a perceived flaw within the individual's appearance. So it could be anything. It could be something that is even an imagined one. It, it might not necessarily be a physical uh, uh, flaw in the appearance. It could be an imagined flaw in the appearance. So the person spends a lot of effort and time in trying to fix that particular problem. They may try so many ways to try and solve it. And sometimes, and in fact, most of the time, they go for very, very extreme uh, processes to try and solve this. And they, they can actually result in so many detrimental outcomes. So basically, that is how it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you say that changing perceptions on what is beautiful and what is attractive is resulting in an increase in cases? Of course. The, the base of this particular problem is the individual's perception. Like I, like in the definition I gave, it's a perceived flaw. So it is it is a perception of the person. The, everybody around them might feel that, oh, there's really nothing wrong with this particular part of your body that you feel that is a problem. Mm -hmm. But the individual continually feels that there is something wrong with that particular part of the body. And of course, you see, you've thrown in another issue that has societal um, uh, pressure, put a societal pressure on the individual. The definition of what beauty is, the be if somebody, if somebody has to be beautiful, you probably should have a, a thick lips and or maybe a very small or thin lips or a, a big ear or a big nose or a big hand or whatever. All of that is based on what the society probably at a particular point in time is defining as beautiful. So in our set, the cosmetic, um, these uh, fashion uh, icons and what they define as beautiful kind of rules the individual's perception of what beauty is and how beauty is supposed to be on their body. And therefore, they keep going after some of these procedures and some of these uh, efforts to try and change the same body parts that they have perceived as having a flaw mm. that they need exactly. Mm. Now, throughout this month, we've been looking at the various forms in terms of um, the changing standards from plastic surgery, people going to the gym, wanting to sculpt, going for um, facials and Botox and, and the likes. And it all points to women being the most affected. Yeah. Is body dysmorphic yeah. disorder, does it affect more women than men or is it equal? Of course, it affects more women, even, <laughs> even in the face value. It affects more women. The reason being that men are not particularly concerned about um, how beautiful they look or how they, yeah, of course. How attractive do, they are. Yes, how attractive they look. But men, well, they, they also feel that how presentable they should be, but not to the extent of the way the women feel about it. Women's perception or women's thoughts about how beautiful they should be goes way beyond what a man or a male would think about what beauty is. And on top of that, it is it is the, the what uh, what the society has defined as beautiful. When that happens, it's not towards the men. It is mainly towards the women. 
this is what is seen as beautiful and this is what men would accept. Mm. And so because of that, the women would go in for that and they would turn the world upside down just to get into that situation that is acceptable to the society and particularly to the men within that society. And and so that they fall prey to this condition. And like I say, it's not, it is seen as a mental disorder, but like I said, there is an extreme form of it that becomes a mental because it has to be persistent and endure, actually uh, affect the function of the individual totally before we say that it is a disorder. So we have the mother from body, um, body image issues or body image illness. So the person will just have a certain uh, obsession uh, that would that would mean that the person is still functional. The person can do whatever they are doing, but they just want to be like that. It could, if it is a simple desire, that is different. So, you know, cosmetic industry targets more of the women than the men because mm. uh, the beauty and everything about being beautiful is more towards the women than the men. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the women are likely to fall prey to this. So it's likely to affect the way that they think about themselves as beautiful and therefore look at a particular part of the body and feel that genuinely they do not have on that part of the body they do not have what is supposed to be there or what's supposed to make them beautiful and therefore they would feel they will fall prey to this okay so at which point in because th there's definitely a, a thin line between wanting to to change yourself and then okay. getting to the point of being described as having body dysmorphic disorder. Exactly how you explain it. It's basically, it's basically a thin line between it. And that's mm -hmm. why it is very dangerous when the individual starts to show signs of a preoccupation with a particular part of the body. Mm. And the intense desire to change that part of the body to suit whatever they are imagining to be beautiful. So if the desire or if that obsession or oh, let me let me bring it this way. If the desire is just about a particular part of the body, or maybe the entire human, the entire body of that individual, but the person is able to be functional within the day, the person is able to do their their daily activity and some one way at a particular one time in a particular point in time, they think about those things and then maybe put in an, a, some effort at certain points in time, in maybe within the month or within the year to really change that part of the body, right? And it is not an intense feeling that would warrant them to be dysfunctional within a particular setting or within a particular time. Then the person would say that we all, we can we can actually put it in a state that, okay, this is the normal desire that anybody can go through. For instance, you are dressing up to go for a party. You want to look nice. You want to look beautiful. That is once, once in a while. Mm. That and it's basically on a particular uh, 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 occasion. Mm. But if you have a real a real obsession that your finger, your index finger, it's not nice. It's not beautiful, and I have to change it. And every day when you wake up and you see, you look at your 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 index finger, and it is for you, it is looking terrible, and you have to do something about it. And you can't even concentrate on the things that you do. You can't even have. You can't even go out to people because you feel your index finger is problematic, and it needs to change it. And you are putting a lot of effort to change it by looking for a solution. And this looking for a solution becomes basically the main activity of your of your day. That means that it's affecting your productivity. That is when it becomes problematic and that's where it falls into the mental health and disorder category. Hmm. And finally, in order to avoid this, how do we need to approach the changing beauty standards and the pressures, especially on women, to conform to these standards? The onus lie on our society as a whole to talk about what what really beauty is. And beauty, uh, as we all say in our local parlance, and since we Africans, we, we, we say that a lot, that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Mm -hmm. And because of that, whatever it is that you perceive as beautiful becomes beautiful in your eyes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if the individual learns or if people learn that what they have is what is for them and it is beautiful in their own way and it is part of them 
then sometimes the, the luring that uh, some of these cosmetic industry uh, players actually put across would not have that uh, much effect on individuals that is likely to be vulnerable to the games that they play. Dr. Daniel Forjo is a clinical psychologist with the Confanochi Teaching Hospital and a lecturer with the Garden City University College. Both of them are in Ghana's Ashanti region. This is WADR's gender program 5050 on West Africa Democracy Radio 94.9 FM in Dakar, Senegal. Today we have discussed ageism, lookism, and body dysmorphia. As we wrap up the program, let's change gears and let me tell you about an all important roundtable discussion that recently took place in Dakar and was organized by the Foundation Women for Africa in collaboration with the Spanish Embassy in Senegal and the Senegalese University of Science Soloum El Hajj Ibrahima Nias. Eminent female university professors and researchers took part in the discussion themed the contribution of Senegalese scientists to sustainable development goals, challenges, and prospects. 5050 has been speaking to Dr. Laura Tall, the research director of the Initiative Prospective Africo et Rural, IPAR, a major agricultural research center, and we've been discussing women in science. I started by asking her about the best way to bridge the gap between men and women in science. Women uh, scientists uh, only represent 25% of uh, scientists in, uh, in Senegal and uh, uh, this is uh, very few when you, when you know that women uh, are 50% of the population. So uh, how can we uh, mend this gap? Uh, there are different options, different strategies. Uh, I would say that the first one would be to uh, make science available to young girls in school, at, in primary and secondary school, and uh, make sure that they get attracted to science because science appears as something difficult, something that, something that is more geared to, to men and, and boys, but uh, science is, is a world of passion. And uh, I think that women and young girls are totally capable of passion. Uh, what is the reason for this disparity? I think that this is uh, cultural. I did my PhD in, uh, in Canada, uh, where uh, we had more women uh, doing uh, biology than, uh, than men. But uh, at the PhD level, there were more men than women. So women are totally able to do science, to do good science, but uh, uh, social and cultural uh, uh, challenges like uh, maternity, the need for them to uh, take care of their home or of their family, don't give them the time and the opportunity to uh, strengthen their skills and go to the PhD level and then to the academia. Tell us a domain we can find more women when it comes to academia. We, we see that women are mostly in the so social science uh, field but uh, yesterday we talked about uh, science and we realized that there are women in uh, hard science like uh, mathematics uh, computer science and so on and uh, they are really good at what they are doing um, in my institution IPAR we are uh, over 50 per people and uh, more than 25 of them are women so any science published realized at IPAR is led or uh, coordinated in a way by women. So we may not be the one visible, but we are part of the science produced in, in the country. How do we get more women into the sciences and taking up top positions when it comes to academia? In Senegal, we have uh, a lot of uh, new universities and the creation of these universities have made uh, available uh, positions for uh, men and women, but 
also for women uh, in the academia and in science. And we see that uh, in terms of recruitment, uh, there is a lot of effort made this uh, university to make room for uh, women scientists. So I am very uh, hopeful that uh, we will uh, soon get more women into science. We will be above this 25% because the, the global number is t uh, around 30% of women in science. Overall and beyond Senegal, what is the African picture looking at? Uh, in Africa, the numbers are around 20, 25 also, so we are in the in the African average mm -hmm. in terms of uh, women in, in science. And why is there less visibility for women scientists, their research and industry in Africa? If we want to have uh, more visibility for uh, research and uh, research led by women, I think that the strategy cannot be only uh, geared towards women because uh, the, the main problem is that our research is not well known, it is not well published. Uh, African researchers publish less than any other researcher in the world. Yeah. This is a problem. Uh, one part of it is uh, can be the language uh, for francophone researchers. Science is made in English and it may be difficult for them. Another problem if we talk about women is that uh, they may have less time than their uh, counterpart uh, to do their research because they have uh, many hats. They need to do the research, they need to take care of their home, they have uh, really heavy social roles, so this can be a burden for them. Mm. And uh, lastly, we tend to be a little bit shy about uh, our knowledge and uh, also about uh, uh, our strengths. Dr. Laura Tal is the research director of the Initiative Prospective Africole at Rural, IPAR. And that's how we end the program for today. Remember to follow our discussion on Twitter and Instagram at WADR News and on Facebook at West Africa Democracy Radio English Service and online at WADR.org. Also remember to leave me a message by WhatsApp at plus two two one seven eight one eight four five four two one again plus two two one seven eight one eight four five four two one and please begin your message with hashtag fifty fifty. I have been your host Atiyewin Imbila Lawson. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to our production team and thank you to our resource persons. Do take care and we'll see you next week. Goodbye for now. It's all I